Saturday, May 15th, 932 here in Phoenix, Arizona. Rocking the Cardinals hat. We're going to do a special show today. Got a special guy, uh, guest today. He's already holding it down online. Oscar Dunlap was involved with Hebrew Israelism for eight and a half, eight and a half years. Specifically, uh, got involved with GOCC, Gathering of Christ Church. A lot of you may have already heard him when he was on Cultish. That was an excellent interview he did, two-part interview called Leaving Hebrew Israelites, Leaving the Hebrew Israelites. Great interview. And uh, we're going to do a follow-up that it, uh, to this interview. And what we're going to do is uh, talk about some of the feedback, both positive and negative, that our brother in the Lord, Oscar, has received. And with that, let's go. shoot hey oscar how's it going this morning man going good man uh blessed to be able to to take part in this man you know been looking forward to it for a little you know. yes sir but yes sir uh well check it um sorry guys i didn't have all my music for the intro but that's all right we got justin lee chambers already we got lenny cash how y'all doing we got other people coming to the live chat so shout out to y'all uh, make sure to hit this like button and grab this link and share it well your first i think public appearance about that i know of uh, as far as your experience with the hebrew Israelites, was on cultish and uh how do you feel overall the interview went uh overall i'd say uh it went pretty well um, there was, you know, there's so much to, to speak about regarding Hebrew Israelites and there's so many different factions, uh, that obviously it can, it, it could only be, uh, so deep. It's kind of a surface, mm -hmm. uh, like an overview of it all. Um, but, but generally speaking, I think it was good to give some insight to maybe some people who don't know too much about it. And then also to give my testimony, give some encouragement that the Lord is, is working even in, in, you know, sex like that. Yeah, amen. I think I think your interview did encourage a lot of people. That's really what I'm uh, hoping and I think I'm seeing so far. I can't tell you how many times, Oscar, someone comes on the channel or asks me, yeah, but does anyone ever leave? And it's great to see uh, examples where people not just leave, but of course they get into good, healthy churches. They get into sound doctrine because that doesn't, doesn't always happen, as you know. So that's been beautiful to see in your case. So how long have you been out of the ideology of Hebrewism? And how long have you been a born-again believer? Uh, just around two, maybe a little over two years now um, yeah. that I've been out. Uh, there, it, was a, it was a process of getting mm -hmm. out of there. It was a process of no longer congregating with them, just, just something stirring in my spirit mm -hmm. and pulling me away. Um, but that was before I was... I would say before I was truly born again, that was a process the Lord was leading me on. Had a conversation with my wife and I just said, you know, this isn't it. I don't know what is, but it's not this, All right? And uh, that was before, you know, some major detoxing had to happen as to me getting out uh, of that theology. Um, but I would say just over two years that I've been truly born again, I can say that. All right, and you're involved with Hebrew Islamism. So that's the ideology. That doesn't mean you were in a camp the whole time. I'm just telling the audience, not you, of course, you know. But uh, Oscar was involved with Hebrew Islamism eight and a half years. How long were you in actual camp? And the camp, everyone, is GOCC, which stands for Gathering of Christ Church. How long were you involved with an actual camp, though? That was about four years. Four years. And part of that time was in Michigan, and part, part of that of time. time was in Arizona, right? Correct. Uh, so you're originally from Michigan? Correct. From so, uh, Ann Arbor. Yeah. So, University of man, so what's your opinion on Columbus, Ohio? <laughs> it's not a, uh, it's not our favorite place. Uh, man, to, to say. that's, that's, <laughs> that's where I was born and raised, man. Right, right. Hey, well, we can uh, kind of unify and being from the Midwest. So I'm okay uh, with that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I guess the weather's the same, except yours is just worse, kind of like everything else in <laughs> Michigan. But hey, I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> that's all right man uh at least you didn't wear blue and blue and yellow here today so all right. all right all right so um let's talk a little bit about uh the aftermath 
the fallout. So this interview is two parts. Part one uh, debuted April 6, 2021, and I encourage everyone to, to hear this, uh, to watch it, and go to thecultistshow.com and uh, get a hold of that. It's also on YouTube. And uh, really good stuff. I think, uh, I know the first one's almost an hour. I believe the second one is too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But uh, what's it been like, man? What have you been hearing? What have you been seeing uh, after this interview aired? Uh, it's been a really uh, unexpected mixed reaction. Uh, like I said, from a lot of Christians, I think it's been encouragement. It's been um, some brief history to maybe give them some footing and uh, speaking to uh, these camps and these Hebrews or like organizations, uh, just something to, to give them some ground to, to begin their research. You know, obviously guys like you uh, who, who have a, a whole ministry that's really focused on, you know, coming against this, this false gospel and these false doctrines. That's, that's where, you know, where you could get more information. But I think my, my interview and my kind of brief overview is going to give them some, some footing and some grounding and also encouragement. Like again, um, that God is working uh, even in remote cults such as this uh, mm -hmm. to bring people to the true gospel. You know, so that was part of it, um, which has been, you know, a great reaction. A lot of a lot of comments and a lot of um, people reaching out to me on Facebook and things like that, which has been awesome. We got someone um, in, the, in the speaking of Facebook and all that. We have someone actually uh, listening in today. Tiffany Johnson, she says 13 years and free almost a year. Thank God. Tiffany, I'd love to hear your uh, your story uh, sometime. Thirteen years is an awfully long time, um, and uh, I would like to know, Tiffany, if you can answer uh, uh, what's your current status. You know, as far as uh, you you and the Lord, and uh, thirteen years were you in a were you in a camp for part of that time? Let me know if you can. But praise God that you're yeah. out for sure. And um, here's a Q Mac. Congratulations, bro. It took me two years to come out of Mormonism. Thank Christ you saved me, you and many others in Jesus' name. So praise God, you know. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, yeah, a lot of people, uh, uh, obviously. Now, I know, you know, uh, it can be hard. So what's some of the negative feedback you've got? Because you, you, you might have got a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a, I got a bit of that. Which is interesting is uh, when I was actually a part of all of this stuff, I never had Facebook uh, during that time. And so... Uh, I think it's been a little difficult for people to find me, but now that I am on Facebook, um, that's when I start getting the messages rolling in. Um, some people that I know and also a lot of Hebrews uh, from different camps and stuff that I don't know. And it's just been, you know, uh, what is to be expected? You know, I'm Judas. I'm siding with the oppressor. Uh, you know, I might actually be Esau, you know, because I'm because what I'm doing, I'm turning away from the gospel and even some regarding my own family uh, who, who have been a part of this as well. And not not anything derogatory, but wanting to know, you know, basically why I apostatized, why I turned away from the faith. Uh, so it's been, you know, really encouraging and really, you know, uh, beautiful things as far as other people reaching out with their testimonies and people who have been struggling. Uh, you know, I've had a couple conversations uh, with people that have family members that's caught up in this stuff. But then on the other side, obviously, very negative things, uh, you know, that's uh you know, kind of trying to uh, paint paint a picture of me as being a traitor, essentially. Right. Yeah. I said I'm a white man and all kind of stuff. Uh, like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, one guy I heard said that. Um, uh, yeah, you sold out because uh, your your oppressor uh, bought you some Panera bread. He bought you lunch, <laughs> and so right, you, right, you, right. you sold out for you sold out for some Panera bread. Did they did they take you to Panera bread? No, uh, good, good. I don't really like Panera bread. I was, ho I don't like I, it at all. I was like, I hope they didn't really take him to lunch at Panera <laughs> bread because uh, he needs a better spot, man. Come all the way right, to right. Phoenix and go to Panera bread. Oh yeah, so look at this, uh, Tiffany Johnson. She seemed wow. This is wow. Yeah, Tiffany, uh, I'd love to hear your story sometime. It doesn't have to be public or anything if you don't want it to be. But if uh, you could hit me up and let me know your story, you or, or one of your family members, or you could contact me together. She says, I'm a Christian. I was once part of ICGJC. Do you, do you know any, do you know much about ICGJC, Oscar? I know I know that they're the originators. I know that as far as, uh, as, far as mm -hmm. you know, the Israelites now. I know they were once ISUBK, right? And they eventually changed the name. Yeah. Uh, they went through a bunch of name changes. Israelite School okay. of Torah way back in the day. And then... Uh, I C U P K for a while, and it was I S U P K, but they didn't keep the name, and they uh, another group got a hold of it. So another group currently bears the name, but right. they're not the actual 
uh, original school, ICGJC, is. And so right. you are correct. And uh, thank you, Liza J, our first Super Chat of the day. It looks like they are working. Shout out to you, Liza J. And shout out to... Oh, yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, so... Would you say, Oscar, that you felt like people were more upset that you left Gathering of Christ Church or more upset that you left the ideology of Hebrewism? Or what's the split? I'm curious how that went shook out. I would say uh, probably more upset that I departed in general. Mm-hmm. I, I got more response from uh, a lot of Hebrew Israelites that weren't actually a part of GOCC. And then the ones that mm-hmm. I did get a for that were GOCC, there weren't people, most of the people weren't people that I actually knew. Right. Uh, you know, they are people from, from different parts of the country, not guys that I actually congregated with. As far as the people that I congregated with at GOCC, mm-hmm. you know, I still have generally the guys that I had good relationships with, I still do. Um, but I, I think in large, the response was this guy was a Hebrew. Even if I switched camps, there wouldn't have been such a big deal that happens yeah. all the time, right? Uh, but leaving it and, and, and actually becoming a Christian and what they, what they would uh, describe as partnering or siding with the oppressor that's really been the response is right. you're a traitor you're judas um you know and, and actually you might be an edomite if if that's the way that you're going yeah isn't it funny you know uh, oscar uh, if they saw you on the street the somebody would give you a flyer and say hey wake up you know as you very well know but Absolutely. all of a sudden if you abandon the ideology all of a sudden your ethnicity is called into question as if your actual <laughs> background like origin is now different because you don't agree with the ideology like right Right. I actually was talking to, uh, I was actually talking to Sakari downtown Tempe just recently, about two weeks ago. The same thing. I walked up to the guys and they giving me flyers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I think that they've been putting it together for a little about a little while who I am. They've seen me on the culture show. I did another like podcast after that. And so, uh, they're kind of putting two to two together. You know, I had some people reach out to me on Facebook and now it's like, Oh, okay, this is the guy. This is, this is the guy, this is the traitor. This is the enemy. And so, you know, totally changed the way that those conversations go. So uh, I think it's fascinating you're saying, hey, now I'm running into Sakari Tempe. Uh, to those who don't know, uh, Tempe is a, a city adjacent to Phoenix. It's where ASU is, Arizona State University. So it's like a little, it's a college city, but it's right next to Phoenix. Uh, most people would just, if they're visiting, would just basically say, oh, I'm in Phoenix. But technically it's called Tempe, and there's a strip out there called Mill Avenue. And uh, you can go up and down. There's all kinds of things. A lot of people bar hop. Whatever, whatever. If it's not a weeknight, though, you'll find some families and business folks. And I've done some videos out there. In fact, I talked to GMS out there. Uh, but oh. with that being said, Sakari is out there. Sakari is another Hebrew Israelite group. Sakari is kind of on one end of the spectrum, everybody, whereas GOCC is on another end. For example, Sakari uh, did a review of this, and, and they said to, uh, to Oscar, well, you were in GOCC, you never really even left Christianity, because some of the other hardcore groups considered GOCC uh, basically a, a Hebrews light version of Christianity or something like that, right? Now, when you are out there, could I think it's fascinating and beautiful the reason you're running into them. It's because not as God, God hasn't just saved you, Oscar, but now what are you involved with that all Christians should be involved with in some way, but what are you involved with that, that you're running into these guys? I'm evangelizing uh, every week, every week, twice a week, as much as I can. We're, we're out preaching the gospel, handing out tracts. Mm-hmm. And so originally how I ran into these guys out on Mill Avenue, they walked past and, you know, immediately sprung conversation and uh, not knowing who I was. I mean, I, I know you know, I, I know a lot of the doctrine. And so I think it caught them as a, a bit of a surprise mm-hmm. um, speaking to a person that's privy to what they believe. And that's really where they, they get the what is perceived to be the upper hand with Christians is Christians are just uninformed. Right. right? They don't know what these guys believe. And so they kind of try to big brother them like, hey, this is our book. We're going to teach you what it is. We're going right. to teach you how, how to interpret it. Well, coming to me and having those conversations is going to be a totally different conversation. And so mm-hmm. that's that's what it is evangelizing and running to. That's not the only ones. ISU uh, or IUIC ran into them as well. Oh, um, we're, so. oh, 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 hold on. I want to I want to hear about this. First of all, shout out to Rocks B for the super chat. <laughs> but yo, you're saying uh, so. I just want everyone to hear. Uh, Oscar, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. He's he's now hitting the streets. He's witnessing and he's evangelizing, and he's not going to like just talk to Hebrew Israelites. But they're out there as well when he'll go out on Mill Avenue. 
and uh, mainly Sakari. But where did you run into IUIC? So everyone listen, that's Israel United in Christ. They're the sort of uh, the middle class professionals. That's their image. And they wear the purple and gold. Their, their images uh, were, were very standardized. They're sort of the Starbucks of the Hebrews light world. Uh, you know, everything is standardized. You know what you're going get, to get. You know, it's a certain way. You should kind of get what you expect because we're all on the same page here at IUIC. At least that's their, their image. But where'd you run into them, brother? I ran into them, into them uh, at First Friday. We were out preaching on First Friday, um, again, handing out tracks. We had a, one of the brothers, uh, Matt, has a big old speaker. And so we just go out there and preach the gospel. And uh, they were down there heavy. You know, I, I, you, I see they're, you know, they, they move in, in uh, massive numbers. Yeah. And so it was a, probably about 15, 20 of those guys walking down. And, they're, you know, they're proselytizing. And that's one thing. Uh, one thing I want to mention, just what you said earlier, you said every Christian should be involved in some way in evangelizing. And it's because obviously it's a great commission right but but mm-hmm. also these these cults they evangelize well we won't call it evangelizing because it's not the good news but they proselytize mm-hmm. you know they really really take that to heart they're out there and that's how they grow that's how they expand and if christians are holding to that great commission and they're out on the streets as well right we can fight against you know uh, the propagation of this of this false gospel, and that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. We're out there, they're out there, and then eventually, you know, there's some clashes of theology, and we we try to tear those strongholds strongholds down. Yeah, it's fascinating, Oscar. Um, when people hit me up and want to know about Hebrewism, things like that, um, some of the the main kind of group that I see is um, people whose family and got involved with it in some way, and there's the concerns. And so, my son my father, you know, this kind of thing. That's probably the number one person that hits me up with, uh, hey, I need to talk to you about this. Da, da, da. Maybe right, not too far behind it, uh, are people who do some kind of street evangelism or involved with regular evangelism. And they come from all varieties of backgrounds. But I find right. a lot of those Christians are the ones who are frequently hitting me up, right? Because they are running into them and they realize what well, what is this you know and so I mean, it's exactly what you said so that is fascinating so it'd be interesting you're with this group and then there's you and there's actually an ex ex former you know Hebrew is like amongst everyone else the fascinating dynamic yeah yeah it is and for me i i i try to i try to poke at them you know i try to i try to i know their their doctrines i know their gospel and so i i go right at that like I said, that, what's interesting, this is interesting. There was a brother out there and he was evangelizing as well. And he had like a very surface level conversation mm-hmm. with some, some people from Sakari. And uh, he was what they would consider a Hebrew Israelite. I believe he was a, a brother of Mexican descent. Oh, he was so, Sakar. It's a car, exactly. Yeah. And so when they were talking to him, they were very, very polite. They were, they were talking about very surface level scripture. They say they follow Christ and they walk away. I'm watching this. They walk away. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, yeah, they seem to be some, uh, some, some Christian brothers. And I'm like, no. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So he just talks to him. He comes yeah. in. He's like, hey, yeah, they got, I mean, they did dress a little bit different. They wear capes, right. but I think they're right. Christians, right? <laughs> he's like, no, right. no, no, bro. No, no. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think these guys, they had on hoodies, they had on some fringes. And so it wasn't too, uh, it wasn't too um, out there right, as right, far right. as parents. And so he had a very brief conversation with them in passing, gave them a track. Uh, and so he walked away from that conversation, like, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, those are some, some Christians. Uh, and I'm like, dude, the, why that happens is because surface level terminology they're going to agree with. You know, you talk about Christ, you talk about God, you know, you talk about the gospel and mm-hmm. you you happen to be who they consider to be an Israelite. They're nodding their head to that. Right. right. Especially they were in passing. They were going to proselytize down the street. Mm-hmm. And so they didn't have time to get into it. And so he walked away like, yeah, yeah, you know, that's uh, that, that's that was pretty cool. Pretty cool conversation. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's why we have to press people. We have to press people on what they actually believe and start defining our terminology to know if we're talking about the same thing. Same thing can happen with a Mormon. You talk to a Mormon, Mm -hmm. surface level conversation, you're like, yeah, Christian. No. You dig into it a little bit and it immediately Yeah, no, good point. That's exactly true, too. So um, I I, I think, um, you know, it's funny. You're talking about all this, and it seems like uh, you'd be able to— you're able to have the kind of constitution or makeup where you can kind of handle uh, some of the criticism because you don't seem too, uh, you know, uh, flustered by it, which is good. Because, I I mean, some people, they come out 
and they really they really are flustered by the way their family and former friends treat them i'm not saying anyone likes it but uh you seem to be able to be pretty even keeled about it uh, i think that's an important thing is to develop sort of what people call unflappability it's a sort of an older word but it's a cool word unflappable is you know you don't get flustered by that you're able to be collected and poised in the midst of all that and uh you seem to have that vibe about you and i wonder and you also are willing to sort of uh go at them you know i'm not not obviously you're you're a gentleman and all that you're probably a better person than i am you know i'm saying you're cool you're chill i wonder if your days of being in the the ring or the octagon helped uh, give you this personality because I don't know if a lot of people know you, Oscar, are a former MMA guy. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is that I'm not I'm, I'm not into all that like that, yeah. but I still find yeah. it fascinating because I feel like some of that must have prepared you. Can right. you talk a little bit about MMA and uh, if if or I'm just you know if I'm out on a limb, but I'd love to hear about it. And shout out to Terry, yeah. Terry, and Jonathan for the super chats. Go ahead, bro. Amen. Uh, I, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's something that someone mentioned to me before and I hadn't really thought about it. And, uh, you know, in God's providence, he brought me through a, a certain life and, and different aspects of life that I, I think prepared me, you know, to be in a position like this and be able to speak against the guys and not be flustered, like you said. So, uh, yeah, uh, I was a fighter uh, for about four or five years and uh, did that every day um, for a long time. And, you know, having that kind of pressure and having that kind of stress and being locked in a cage with a person that's trying to do you bodily harm, right? Uh, you know, that, that kind of prepares you to, to go up against guys who are just speaking words to you. No one's, uh, no one's trying to physically harm me. And so, uh, you know, having insults and things of that nature is not really going to affect me too much. Um, one other thing I want to mention uh, regarding something that, that you actually shared with me is uh, we have to be prepared uh, we have to be prepared in order. I mean, we have to be prepared for people speaking out against us, even people that come from our fold. I know you deal. I know you have to deal with a lot of Christians that come against you and say, hey, what you're doing is not right. Yeah, uh, you, yeah. know, just, you just you just preach the gospel and you live a, a, a Christian life. And that's how we're going to reach the masses. That's how we're going to um, you know, evangelize these people who are of these different theologies. And you're like, no. You know, we're going to come at them. We're going to expose these false gospels. We're going to cast down these strongholds. And it's the same. I think I see with you. It's like you're unaffected, which is a beautiful thing, because that means that you can be used in the areas that other guys maybe can't be because they are flustered. So I had some 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 brothers reach out to me. They're like, you know, they seen uh, some of the some of the comments and some of the things in response to my interview. And they're like, hey, man, you're right, man. You need you need prayer. And I'm like, oh, I always need prayer. But regarding <laughs> this stuff, nah, it, I'm not sweating it at all. And being a part of it for so long, I know what to expect. I know right. what to expect. Like it's unexpected. You know? That's good, man. That's 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 really good because uh, it's it's not easy. And um, you know, just uh, even a solid, strong Christian, it's hard for them to a, a lot of times want to be involved or be like, hey, let me make Hebrewism a specialty and dealing with the people involved with that and and the ideas, you know, set Corinthians ten five, casting down those. The strongholds, those imaginations, you know, those arguments that lift themselves up against Christ. Um, right. Because uh, all of a sudden uh, they tell a guy their name, and next thing you know, this guy's scouring their Facebook page to find pictures right. of his children and, and uh, uh, pictures of his wife and stuff. And people are like, wait, yeah. what? You know, they're not, they're not really quite ready for that, which is exactly the second uh, Sakari found out about you. The first thing he did is go find out who your wife was because yep. they mentioned it in the show. It's one of the first things yep. he mentioned, right? Absolutely. And he wasn't Absolutely. even, by the way, my perception, you know, we don't need to talk about that. I don't think, I don't even think what he said about her was even correct anyway. So he was just talking smack. Right. Right. That's funny. Like I got probably uh, a week before that video came out, the guys that I talked to <laughs> in, uh, in Tempe, they found me on Facebook and, and I, I seen in something that I had said, they started commenting, commenting and, uh, I think they were doing some recon on me. You know, I think they were looking into, uh, they were like, oh, this the guy? And another guy was like, yeah, that's him. And they were like, oh, it's about to go down. And a couple of days later, that video comes out. So I think that's the recon, you know, they're going to land. And again, you shared something with me, the same thing. Oh, it's, it's about attacking you personally. And it's mm -hmm. not about theology. It's not about doctrine. Though they'll go there, you know, they want to tear you down, you know, and again, to be expected. Yeah, yeah, that's true, man. Um, I'm... I'm glad you're able to to handle it and, and deal with all that. Um, so going forward, um, 
what are you what are you kind of looking at next you know like um obviously you got fa- family praise god you, you're involved in church life what are you directions you feel god has having you go in, in ministry and stuff like that like wh- what are you trying to look at next like i understand i think you just enrolled in seminary for example can you talk about sort of what's next for you absolutely uh from the time that, that god really brought me to life and and uh you know awakened me to the truth of the gospel uh there's been a uh, there's been a, a fire in me to grow in the knowledge of God. And I think most Christians could uh, identify with that. Um, but prior to coming into being a Christian, I already had the desire. And I would say more so um, uh, what I've been told is is a way in explaining uh, scripture. Uh, not anything that I'm identifying in myself, but this is what I've been told. And, and so I was being groomed and prepped to be a teacher in, in GOCC. Um, that said, uh, coming over to this side and to the truth, um, from the beginning, it's been a, a desire not only to grow in the knowledge of God, but to share the word. Um, and so that's getting into evangelism was natural for me. It was, a, it was a natural step to, you know, to take after that. So immediately I, uh, I get involved with um, the church, which is an apologia church. And immediately they're a very active church. I get into evangelizing. And uh, from that point, um, again, just this, just this, I feel like, uh, a calling for me to move forward um, in that in that uh, kind of mindset, and so yeah, enrolling in seminary was just again a next logical step of uh, being trained and being uh, uh, properly uh, groomed for the role of uh, leadership in ministry. And I think one thing I want to mention regarding the Hebrews is that uh, because they 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 enclose themselves in this theology, right? They don't really have any outside influences all interpretation of scripture is in-house, right? Mm-hmm. And so when I got into uh, true biblical Christianity, into Reformed theology, man, the, 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 the resources and the literature is just, this heritage of, of rich uh, Christianity has just exploded uh, in my mind and, and, and you know, my, my, my library. And so I'm learning and I'm feeding uh, so much and I'm growing so much in the knowledge of God and I'm so thankful and I just want to learn this stuff and be able to properly iterate it and spread it uh, and share it with others. And so uh, that's what that's what seminary is about. It's just getting in there and being trained and being groomed and having the right resources uh, so that I can share the gospel more effectively, be used by God to do that. Yeah, praise God for that. Um, you know, Hebrew Islamism is very disconnected from church history. And, um, you know, they'll say that... Uh, <clears throat> They, do, they they have their reasons. The, the most you'll see sometimes with some of these guys is they'll try to, every now and then you'll see some of them try to find some kind of what they view as a precedent for what they're doing. So right. I, I know so, I've seen some guys try to say, oh, we're just continuing what the Ebionites were doing. We're, we're like the modern day Ebionites. And uh, oh. you, you see a very surface level or you see like, um, you know, kind of vague criticisms of church history and things like that. And uh, really, Hebrew Israelism is, uh, I, I think, can be classified as the same type of movement as Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormonism. There's other groups, I'm just naming the most two prominent. Right. Restorationists. Those are called restorationist groups, and that means that the claim that they have is essentially that it's sometime around the death of the last apostle. You know, they, they'll look at this in different ways. But if you talk to a Mormon Jehovah's Witness, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They talk about the great apostasy, for example. And there's been this aw- awakening of the true gospel and the truth in these last days. Now, when they always start, it's always the last days. It's the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, the, the, the Watchtower Society is infamous for failed predictions that they've Absolutely. made throughout the 20th century, right? And uh, <clears throat> when you, you, you look at that, it's a restorationist movement. And what it does is it says, so this is the truth that was lost now it's we're bringing it back and there's something exciting about that to people it's sort of salacious in nature it's not a not a good thing to to think that's what you need almost as if the lord you know has had no witness uh of any kind of strong and strong sense for the past you know two two thousand years or so and i really think hebrew islamism is the same kind of thing it's disconnected from church history in that way i mean um when you're involved, uh, it wasn't real church history you you may have been seeing promoted. It was books like Illuminati <laughs> Two. <laughs> exactly, absolutely, man. You, you hit it. You hit it right on the head, man. I, I, and just to add to that, um, all that what you said can can be 
can be seen in all of these groups. And so what it does, what, what they do is they say, even though Christ says he's going to build his church, right? The gates of hell should not prevail against it. So, so there's going to be a constant progression of the church of Jesus Christ being built throughout history. And we know this from scripture. And we, as Christians, can go back and look throughout history and see this, uh, this prophecy being continuously fulfilled in the growth of the church. What they would say is, uh, yeah, he's going to build his church, but he's going to wait mm, about 2,000 years, you know, about 1,800 years to start building it after this great apostasy. And now what happens is they become the sole authority as to how scripture is interpreted. Because they say the gospel was lost, there was this great apostasy. Now we are the ones that have it. Now interpretation of scripture becomes a matter that is predicated on their understanding and their theology, right? And so all the people that are inside of these, these cults, right? Like you said, they're totally disconnected, right? So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm existing in this in this 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 box uh, uh, that that I'm very limited as to the resources, uh, extra biblical resources that I can go to uh, to grow in my knowledge of God, growing in different mm -hmm. doctrines, growing, you know, concept of covenant theology. I have no idea. I have no idea about it. Right. Uh, they would have their own concept of it, but it's not a mm -hmm. word that they use. Um, eschatology, like you said, that's the, that's the pressing point. If I could get people to believe that the end is near and that God is waking up people in the end, mm -hmm. right? It also lends uh, to a, to a ur urgency in um, you know coming under the toolage of, of one of these groups and kind of being groomed in their theology. So you're 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 right on point with that. Man. Yeah, and you know, Oscar, we mentioned the ICGJC because there was a sister in the chat who had been involved with 13 years, and they are a continuation of the original school, and right. uh, all these schools. Uh, essentially came out of uh, the school that was ICGJ, ICGJC before, which was was at 1 West 125th Street in Harlem. And, um, you know, uh, Raka, uh, you know, was involved, I believe, in the Philly branch of all that kind of stuff. And right. he, here's, here's why I bring that up. You know, when 1 West was 1 West, they uh, were making these predictions in the 90s. Um, that in 1999, at the latest, when it turned 2000, uh, but that Yahawashai was going to come back and it was the end of the world. And you can find these videos where they're like, there's only a certain amount of years left and all that. And um, the crazy thing is, uh, obviously it didn't happen. And then they came up with excuses as to why. But right. a lot of those guys uh, still embrace the ideology of Hebrew Islamism. It was like, um, you would hope like they would kind of be like, wait, this is a big deal. You know, this, right. fail. but a lot of them just kept on with the, and some, a lot of them stayed there. You know, it was right. other things later on that had them leave. But uh, did you guys ever talk about the prophecies and that stuff? Did, did you ever hear much about the old school? Cause I know you were involved with the beginnings of, of uh, a, a chapter of GOCC. Did you ever hear much about the history of like their understanding of their movement in and of itself, besides saying, you know, Moses was a Hebrew Israelite, but like, uh, did you hear much about that? No, yeah, no. I, yeah. what, what's funny is most of the history, honestly, most of it I heard from you, you know, which is such a blessing that you would bring some of the stuff out. Cause like you said, it's, it's, it's really oral tradition, right? None of this stuff right. is like written down. Right. right. And so you got to go and go and investigate and find out because they wouldn't tell you. And for GOCC, it's really a matter of separating. Right. They really want to separate from that from that one West heritage. They want to kind of stand alone. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you see in GOCC, there's a different theology regarding uh, there's a different soteriology. Right. They believe that other people outside of Israelites can be saved when uh, most of the groups, I would say, or a large percentage of them uh, would not agree with that. Uh, and that's why they would say I was always a Christian, because I believe that, you know, anyone right. can be saved. I, I, I had an understanding of a hierarchy in salvation, but I still believe other people could be saved, and, and they would say that that's Christianity. Also, what you see with GOCC is in a separation from that is it's the name that they rendered to God, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, you know, based on Exodus chapter three, and it's Ahia. So they would say the Tentagrammaton is a is a false name attributed uh, to God um, that it, it's been inserted into the text, and this was one of the conversations between. <laughs> <laughs> you know, between uh, uh, Dr. James White and, and Recall, where that was a that was a big issue, where he was like, yeah, yeah, you know, it was the Masoretes they injected that in the first century, and, and uh, Pastor James was like, you said what century? Yeah, what century? And he was like, uh, later on he tried to change it, and uh, you know, he said, oh, the seventh, the seventh to the eleventh century, and Pastor James was like, it's ninth century, and how could you inject something in the ninth century that's in the scrolls? 
right? That yeah, yeah. How can you as, inject something when you don't exist yet? Is before you're, you're not around. even present. Yet. Yeah, right. how, and so it's a bizarre claim. It's really sort of a Back to the Future ish, you know. But Absolutely. it was clear Rakal's timeline was wrong. Well, let's talk a little hey. bit of, of, about that debate. So um, you were in GOCC, the Michigan branch, I believe, when this debate happened. Between no, James, I was I was in Arizona, Arizona by then. Time. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. So you were in Arizona, and uh, did you watch the debate live? How did you hear about it? What was your reaction with you and the circle you're involved with with this debate that happened? I believe 2016, 2016, right. I think in June, if I'm not mistaken. And so this would be we're coming to basically the five year anniversary of this debate. Talk a little bit about uh, the inside reaction there. Yeah. Uh, so I was. Um... I don't know if I watched it live. I watched it um, soon after it aired, soon after it aired, and uh, this is my first. Uh, again, like I said, I exist in this box, and so I don't know much about actual Christianity. I don't know uh, who the who, who who are the guys who are at the head of uh, things like a uh, um, you know um, uh, who are apologists. I don't know anything about any right. of these guys. Right? Neither did Ricard. Right? Because I, he he remember no. he was calling James White rich. Right for for like the whole first part of the conversation, he's like, "Yeah, Rich." Uh, like, and then he was calling him slick. Man, yeah. You know what's like funny though? Was his name. I saw a, I saw a uh, funny meme after that debate because he was calling him slick as a you know insult, but before that he was calling him rich, and uh, uh, <laughs> the 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 comment was, uh, "I'm slick, James, Rich." Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. That that uh that was pretty funny yeah I'm yeah and that's what you, see. you see uh he, he so so what's what's surprising to me is like man you did no research like you don't know who you're talking to how could you ever be prepared for a discussion if you have no idea who you're talking to right and he happened to be talking to James White which is not the guy that you want to talk to if you're not going to do research right it's not the guy that you want to come up against but anyway um so i'm uh, when i'm a part of gocc i eventually i watch it i think soon after it, it, it airs and uh the reaction is is the reaction at the time was like that didn't look so good you know that that that's not what we expected you know right. for a long time gocc and i think they still do they had a, a radio show and yeah. so they would invite all of these guests on here but again i think they would blindside these guests these guests don't really know who they're talking to they don't really know what they're talking about and so it would look as if it would look as if to the people who are a part of GOCC that Rakar's just getting the better of all of these guys. Right. right? Not a whole lot of Christians. Not a whole lot. There, there's some Christians on there, but not a whole lot. So you're going up against guys who are uh, in Islam and guys who believe in uh, evolution. And we know it's not really it's not real hard to come against these these false theologies. But when you come against Christians, uh, it's a different it's a different it's a different uh, different conversation. But. So, so I say that about I say that to say coming against Pastor James. That's what's expected—a conversation that we normally see on uh, the, the the search, uh, the radio, the radio show, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just totally different than anything we've ever seen, right? right. We never really seen them get out of their comfort zone and really expose themselves or, or make themselves vulnerable to true biblical exposition. And so, to see that happen, the conversation did not go uh, how we thought it would. And there was a lot of fallout. There was a lot of uh, uh, trying to make up in response videos to what happened. So they did a, our, hours of presentation trying yeah. to answer things that they couldn't answer live. There's so much that and he just you know the answer. guy, the guy who introduced um, Gabar. Uh, I think he read a scripture. I forgot what he did at the beginning. The guy right. who introduced Gabar in that situation now has come out of Hebrewism. Amen. I, I mean, and that's the guy that you interviewed, right? Yeah, I interviewed him, and it was, yeah, it was yeah, the very, yeah. he was involved with that response in it to an extent. And now right. he's praise God, praise God. Yeah, he, he he brought some light to that. He said, "Yeah, I was that guy on the other side, kind of feeding him that information." He's like, he brought up the he brought up the uh, the Masoretes in, in the timeline. He said, "We had no idea about that," and so we're searching. So when you see recall kind of make up for what he just said, <laughs> you know, you don't. Yeah, exactly. You you yeah. you see that. He's trying to make up. You see somebody feed him. And, and Pastor James even, like, noticed this. He was like, dude, you're saying stuff that I can't have any faith that you actually ever read before. Right? You, you're just you're just grabbing resources that you don't, you, you're not actually privy to. Right? And what it does, I mean, it, it shows some intellectual dishonesty. Like, you don't have these resources. You haven't studied them. You don't even know where they come from. And you're just throwing stuff out there. So he actually noticed that as well. And so that was, like I said, it was a, it was a, it was some red flags for me, even at the time. 
but it's still still I held to it because I believed it at the time. And so it was like it looked bad, but it was just probably because he wasn't really prepared for it. Last thing, and then maybe we'll try to do a little interaction with some of these clips if we can. The last thing is, uh, how did the Lord really bring you out? Because I I, I I heard a version of it, and I thought it was pretty cool the way the Lord used His Word. How did the Lord bring you out, man? So uh, being being that I was very isolated in in, in this in this you know Hebrewism, uh, there was no one actually to preach the gospel to me. Right. Like I said, my family, they, they, they have been involved with Christianity, like most families, I would say, in America, but nothing, uh, nothing too serious. Keep it going. I, I need to I need to step away for a minute. Go. Go ahead. I, I got to do one thing. I, but I'm going to put you on solo. So the story is yours. Okay. All right. I'll be right back. All right. Um, I would say uh, somewhat uh, nominal uh, Christianity. Uh, that said, um, coming out of being a Hebrew Israelite and kind of stepping away for a moment, uh, God used his word to really uh, bring the gospel to me and, and, and really transform me, bring me to life. And the verse that was used was Mark 10 and 18, the conversation of Christ when Christ was speaking to the young rich ruler, uh, which is interesting because I haven't any, heard anyone else uh, mention this uh, verse uh, in regard to kind of a, a salvation verse for them. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm, I'm driving to work at four o'clock in the morning um, and, and I'm kind of going through all of this stuff at the time. I just stepped away from congregating with GSCC Detroit at the time. And uh, God really used that verse. So that verse is going over and over in my head. Um, and, and basically what Christ is saying there is there's none good but God, right? The man comes up to him and he calls him good teacher, a good rabbi, right? He says, what must I do to inherit uh, eternal life, right? inherit salvation? And he says, uh, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. And so what that brought me to is just, first of all, I hadn't even read that scripture recently. It was just going over and over in my head, four o'clock in the morning. And it's, there's none good but God. There's none good but God. There's none good but God. And my mind is just like zeroing in on this. And then it, it, it what clicks to me in that moment is there's none good but God. But scripture uh, unequivocally and, and very clearly uh, shows us that Christ is in fact good. In fact, that was the next uh, you know logical thought in my mind was, well, Christ is good. So he says that there's none good but God, Christ is good, then Christ must be God, right? Christ is good, Christ is the sinless one. In fact, how could he save anyone if he wasn't himself good, right? It's, it's what we know is double imputation, right? We receive the goodness, the righteousness of Christ, Christ, uh, our sin is laid upon Christ. So God takes them and he switches them, our sin, his righteousness, he switches them and that's how we're saved, right? We receive the grace uh, and the reward of his uh, righteous life uh, in the reward and the promises uh, of the new covenant. And what's laid upon him is the punishment for our sins. So that was really the, the, the verse that did it for me. Um, God, you know, used that verse to really bring me to life and show me uh, the truth of, of Christ's identity. And so I would say pretty much simultaneously, I uh, believed in the Trinity, just like that. Um, God, God is good. Christ is good. Christ is God in the flesh. But who else could save us hmm. but him who created us, you know? Um, and so that, that, that was the, that's pretty much the story is that verse was used. And uh, just like that, it was, it blew my mind. Honestly, it blew my mind because I was under the perception that Christ, obviously, we didn't we, we didn't believe in the Trinity. We didn't believe that Christ was God. We believed that he was the word of God. Right. The son of God. Right. But we couldn't we I didn't I didn't make that jump of him being God in the flesh. And so that that just blew my mind. I'm driving to work, man. I'm, I'm in tears. I'm you know, it, it's a it's a it's a beautiful moment of, of really seeing God's hand on me um, in that moment. And I go to work and I, I work at a prison, so I, I don't have my phone can't have my phone in the facility and I'm just itching to get home to talk to my wife about this because we've been in this process of turning away from Hebrew Israelism, getting away from it because something just wasn't right. Um, and what wasn't right is we didn't know who Christ was. We didn't know who the savior was. Amen. And therefore, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't truly identify ourselves as Christians. And they kind of tell you that, which is good. They tell you straight up, not like Mormons who will be like, yeah, right. we're Christians. Well, Hebrews will tell you, no, we're not Christians. Right? right. And so coming out of that, you know, that was just, you know, that was a beautiful thing. Praise God, man. That's amazing to hear. And I love the way uh, the scripture was uh, key to that. And it's interesting because it's a scripture that a lot of times you'll see like Muslims or someone, for example, trying to use 
<laughs> against the deity of Christ. Act, and yet it's act. clear that when the Lord's drawing you to himself, it's like, um, wait, that's not what that's saying at all. It's a beautiful thing to see. Um, let's see if we can take a little bit of time and uh, look at one of these response videos. We're not going to get through all of it. Maybe we'll just watch a little bit of it. I wish I could put it on higher speed. Um, and everyone, uh, there may be some language in this, not from Oscar or myself, um, a language in the Captain America sense, if you guys know what I mean. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> watch out when I play some of this. Um, but uh, we're going to try to look at some of this and just, just get a feel. So uh, one Sakari member named Hakka, he made uh, this two-hour reaction uh, to the interview. And we're going to just try to look. I don't have necessarily clips laid out. We're going to kind of just look through this and, and just kind of look and get a general sense of it. All right, let's do this, Oscar. Let me bring this up. Yeah. Let me go in here. All right, and let's... All right, so here's the beginning right about, uh, yeah, here we go. What's cultish and what's not. All right, let's, Straight, let's go back to the definition. Oh, that's let's just, go back to the, that's really, all right, let's see. Oh, let's see. Let's get when he's actually got you talking. That's what I want to get. Okay. All right, so here we go, Oscar. In, in the cult. So what do you do with that? Let's go back there. Let's go back to this video co-host here i'm here as always with andrew the super sleuth of the show how are you doing my fellow sleuth hey i'm doing great man and i'm extremely excited for this episode because the person we're interviewing is actually one of our brothers that goes to our church yes and god is good and his providence is amazing right mm -hmm. no absolutely if you guys know what the word providence is it just means from a religion from a theological perspective god uh foreseen that this brother was going to go into a cult known as the Hebrew Israelites and then end up in this Cracker's church. So look at the providence of God. Wow. And, like and all actuality. So go ahead. I'll pause it. That I said, I like how he just totally misrepresents what providence means. That God is like looking through time and it's like, yeah, this is what's going to happen. You know, and that's another thing. We, we understand that God is orchestrating all of time. We don't mean that God seen that this would happen. We mean that God orchestrated that this would happen. You know, so just off the beginning, that's something that I, I noted is it, it, that was a not a fair um, definition of what the, what we mean by that. Right. Yeah, it's it's funny. Uh, everything's racialized. You know, with Haka uh, foreseeing that he's going to go to this crackish church. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's that's what you're going to get, guys. It's going to be a lot more of that. So uh, here, continuing on playing it here. Um, let's see. Got on the screen again. Uh, we're gonna... right. And um, so when this came to me, when my uncle brought it to me, it just kind of fit. It nudged right in with some of the things that I was. So I first got into it. And all these various cities, elders, based on people that go through their uh, and around the 15th, 16th uh, century. Get the Moses. I will have mercy on how mercy and have compassion on how compassion. I think that's in the book of Numbers. He he does this all through Romans 9, 10, and 11, just taking one line from Numbers, one line from Malachi, one line from Isaiah, one line from Hosea, one line from Genesis. So you can't say we're doing it wrong. We're doing what the Bible says. We're doing what we've seen. Christ, even Christ did that. So please stop saying that we have an improper hermeneutic. You guys have a... a, a, a Narcissistic hermeneutic. <laughs> you understand? Let's keep going. There, uh, that's actually right, a so good place. These few checks here. Check this and out. Oscar, whole uh, uh, that he's trying to defend their the way they interpret scripture. Yeah, you right. know. And uh, I'm going to read the section here in a second. But I just want to let everyone know the 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 charge of narcissism, which he was trying to. Utilize yeah. that's something we first said against Hebrew Israelism's interpretation. He's totally biting our term there that we utilize against them. We were the ones who first said Hebrew Israelites in, are involved in a, a Narsa Jesus because their uh, interpretation, everything's about them. And now you see him he, he biting our word. Right, right, right. But right. so we go to Isaiah 28 and it says this for it is precept upon precept, uh, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. 
And that is how the Hebrews Elites justify their interpretation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because he was trying to uh, essentially give an apologia for right. their uh, eisegesis. Right. And so what, what I said in the interview, and, you know, uh, if anyone watches it, they'll, they'll see this, is obviously we know that there are parallel texts in which we uh, can kind of uh, construct a foundation for certain doctrine. We, we can see that there's texts that, that we can point to. Uh, the, that wasn't the problem. Uh, but what I was saying, the problem is they 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 uh, they get these precept upon precepts of, of what they would call precept upon precept, and and it's a improper interpretation. That's the problem. It's not that you got you can jump over here and get one verse and jump over here and get one verse. What we see the uh, the apostles do in their uh, epistles, it's if you're doing that with an improper uh, understanding of scripture, you're 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 building on a foundation that is not true, um, and that's what you see happening there. And the and the other prop the other problem with that is it's not within the full extent of 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 uh, the context of scripture. And so they'll take a verse like Christ saying, "I've only come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel," right? And they'll say, "Look, Christ only came for the Israelites," but they totally disregard uh, Matthew twenty eight when he's given the great commission and he says, "Go out into all the nations." And make disciples baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that part they disregard. And if they don't disregard it, if you ask them what that means, they'll say, oh, no, that just means he's going to go to all of the Israelites within these various nations. And so there's an explaining away. So the way that they uh, do this precept upon precept, it doesn't stand um, against a true biblical exposition. Uh, if you're going to hold to scripture, hold to it. Right. And so when we do these parallel texts, we can jump around to show uh, what scripture says, but it won't come outside of the context of the entirety of scripture. All scriptures God breathed, and we, we know that and believe that. Um, but you have to stay within the confines of scripture. And, and if you try to take one little part of it, you can make the Bible say a lot of different things. And that's what all of these cults do. They all do that. They jump around, they make scripture say what they want it to say, and that's how they, you know, they, they build a doctrine on that. No doubt. We have a fellow uh, or a former um, uh, I see GJC uh, member in in the in the live chat. Sam Miguel, shout out to him. Now we're still praying that the the Lord would work on him because uh, he has turned to atheism. But we still got love for him, and uh, it's nice to see him around every now and then. All right, let me look at Isaiah twenty eight since he brought it up, and uh, you know Haka there. And uh, I want to I want to show something here. Uh, actually, I'm going to start at verse one. And I'm going okay. to show you, uh, I'm not, well, I don't mean you, I mean the audience, just so everyone understands. Right. I'm going to show you, the audience, uh, the full context of Isaiah 28, because they're not even using verse 10 properly. Surprise, surprise, right? So this section is, there's a judgment on Ephraim and a judgment mm -hmm. on Jerusalem. And listen, starting in verse 1, what it says, everyone. Ah, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has one who is mighty and strong like a storm of hail a destroying tempest like a storm of mighty overflowing waters he cast down to the earth with his hand the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim will be trodden underfoot and the fading flower of its glorious beauty which is on the head of the rich valley will be like a first ripe fig before the summer when someone sees it he swallows it as soon as it is in his hand so everyone familiar with biblical language should be able to see this part of uh, the the prophet Isaiah's work, right, is a judgment text uh, specifically against the tribe of Ephraim, who one Wester say are actually Puerto Ricans. So shout out mm -hmm. to all the, the Boricuas in the, in, the, in the live chat. And uh, you, you see it's clearly a judgment text. It's important to keep that in mind. And this idea of, of drunk is not necessarily, although it may have been the case, that they're all drink, day drinking all the time or something. They're, they're a bunch of drunks. The idea is like that's the way they sort of spiritually are, right? Uh, not, not comprehending, mocking, right. loud, belligerent, right? It's a, it's a way to describe this, their spiritual state, right? A state of stupor. Now look at verse 5. In that day the Lord, that's Yahweh, not Yahweh, the, the, in that day Yah, Yahweh of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. So notice, even in the judgment text, there's always a remnant. And it's not based upon ethnicity because this is speaking within his own people, right? At the time there, these are people who are still faithful to Yahweh. And a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate, right? So you see that there, there's going to be a remnant who will still be strong and able to even fight off defenders, so to speak, while 
while while their fellow countrymen are drunk, in essence, right? So <laughs> you're, you're getting a very clear picture, everyone. This is Isaiah 28. You'll notice when they go to verse 10, they never really uh, look at the rest of the, they don't even, they don't even, they, it's totally isolated, right? right. Uh, verse 7. These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. Now, that's important, everyone, because it says not just Ephraim, the priest and the prophet. These are supposed to be Israel's leaders. They're right. describing a staggering with strong drink, right? Do you, everyone, you must understand this because this puts to lie their interpretation of this. This is showing how Israel is astray. There is a psalm around it, even though. Even even their own leaders, right? Priest and prophet, that's a big deal. They are swallowed by wine, which is ironic. You're supposed to swallow wine, but yet wine is swallowing them. See that? They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. And by the way, there's the interpretation. If someone's like, well, you're just making that up about them. The drunk is an analogy. Well, it shows you. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. You guys see that? For all tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. So they're drinking so much, they're just throwing up everywhere, right? It's like that scene in, um, if you you guys have ever seen Stand By Me? Remember, they have that guy who who uh, does a pie eating contest and to get revenge on the t- t- town. He throws up on everybody. <laughs> That's the picture, right? Verse nine: To whom will he teach knowledge, and to whom will he explain the message? It's saying they're all drunk idiots. Who's even going to be able to hear? Right? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast. It's saying, how can these people who are like little children understand what I'm saying? For it is. Um, uh, and, and really, though, this is this part right here uh, is really more along the lines of the, the idea is most likely the Israelites sort of speaking back to Isaiah. And uh, they're saying, uh, how are you going to teach us? How, how, how are you, you going to really show us this? You're just, you're just going to show uh, little kids because it's basic stuff is what he's saying in verse 9. And that's where it says, for it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And if you look at it in the Hebrew with the repetition of the words, it sounds almost like gaga goo goo. It's like baby talk is the idea. So the point is, they're saying, yo, who are you going to teach? Little babies, little kids? Because that's all you got. This is this is their response. It's scoffing. And now watch this. For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to his people, to whom he says, said, this is rest, give rest to the weary, and this is repose. And they would not hear. The word of the Lord will be to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, and that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So notice... You can tell by verse 11, everybody, that, that, that God essentially gives a response. For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to his people, saying, so you don't want to hear my prophets? I'm going to instead send conquerors. That's how you're going to learn. Uh, you're, going to, you're saying it's baby talk. That's who's going to, who's going to speak to you. Do you, you see, and we could go on there, but really this is just describing something that Paul lays out in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. And here's what it says. And this is true of most of our Hebrews like friends in their current state. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but he himself is to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. First Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. That's in essence what's happening there. And so um, I just want to – I'll stop right there because I don't want to uh, – I'm trying to do a response. But uh, could you say something about that? Because it's so – that's important to their interpretation is this precept upon precept, which means – and he's trying to say that that's what they were doing in the scripture, right, that they're right. imitating they're imitating that kind of bad hermeneutic basically. Right. Uh, just to add to what you're saying, it's judgment. That, that, they take that as something to mean uh, that this is, this, is, this is prescriptive of how you are to understand scripture. When, when in reality, that verse – all that you see right there is God – that's judgment language. God's saying you guys are drunk with wine, right? Spiritually, you're drunk, right? And 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 uh, uh, like you said, speaking of speaking of speaking to them uh, as children, right? Or, or they're given the response, and then and then God's response is uh, basically judgment is going to happen, right? People are going to be sent against you, and this is how you're going to know that God's word is true. Uh, so so just the way that they the way that they kind of isolate that, they can make it say what they want it to say. Like you said, they never give context. So what is Isaiah 28 actually talking about? What, what, are, what are we talking about when, when you pluck this verse out of nowhere? It's not that we can't take verses and parallel them with other verses. It's right. do you have the context of that verse in order to do that? So when you see, when he points to Paul, look, Paul's doing this. Well, Paul's giving you systematic theology. He's showing you how this verse is related to this verse. He's showing you fulfilled prophecy. 
right? That's not what you guys are doing. You guys are jumping around to make a verse say what you want to say. If you give it context, it's going to say totally, something totally different. Right, that's a perfect point what you just made. So when we look at Romans 3, everyone, if you go through Romans 3, which is this clear biblical indication of uh, total depravity, uh, this idea of radical corruption down to humanity's core. Now, I've seen Sakari specifically use this to try to say that uh, where it says at the end here, where it says um, <laughs> there is there are none who do good, no, not even one. I've, right. I've seen them try to use that. They actually have a lesson called there is no good white man, and they use this as a condemnation to say there's no good white man. <laughs> Wow, and uh, wow. Sakari specifically, and and right. so when you when you look at Romans three, it is true. It's a potpourri of verses from the Hebrew scriptures. So sure. there's all these different places that Paul draws from, which shows, by the way, the New Testament is saturated with uh, the Old Testament. That's true, Amen. and that's beautiful, and that's epic. Uh, now, here's the important thing: is just what Oscar said. Paul is doing systematic or even biblical theology, where he's taking a theme and things that are clearly speaking to that theme from the Old Testament scriptures. He's putting together in a line because they're all thematically related. These aren't separate ideas that he's putting together and putting one in front of the other that then go and misinterpret the next one that he wants to do, which is what one Westism teaches you to do. You build upon one interpretation and even their foundational verse for how they do that, Isaiah 28, they're misusing that. It's a perfect example. They're taking a verse that doesn't mean that. It's a judgment scoffing text by the Israelites saying that. It's not how you're supposed to interpret the Bible. And uh, then they take that and then they'll go to these other verses and they just put verses in front of each other to inhibit your understanding of what it would naturally be based upon the context when you get to there. It's sort of a setup. So yeah. it, you're exactly right. Paul's not doing that. He's taking things that in their context are about this topic of sin, right. about this right. context of depravity. In their context, they're about uh, how wicked uh, humans are and humans can be and that kind of thing. And that's this universal condemnation that he gives to Jew and Gentile alike, which is why I all need the gospel. It's a flowing argument. And here's what's so interesting, though. I don't know what GOCC does with Paul, but I could tell you, Haka specifically, the person who responded to you, uh, Sakari, he says that Paul went off, that, that Paul lied sometimes. Mm -hmm. and you can find the clips are all over. There's even a former Sakari member who shares a lot of this and shows how these guys discount basically, uh, you know, essentially half the New Testament canon with their discount of Paul. Now, not all Hebrews like groups do that, everyone. I'm saying the person responding to him is doing a cheat because they're going to try to use misuse, of course. Paul to say we're we're just doing what Paul did when they don't even believe Paul's authoritative anyway so it doesn't make sense why he would even oh. be using Paul when Paul, he says Paul went off so why is he doing that I know what he probably said well you yeah, you Christians do because in his response I don't know if you caught this he said Paul whom a lot of you Christians worship heard it yep yep I heard yeah. that I heard that now, see I know actually yeah again I, I seen a I seen a conversation it was it was when uh I was, it was a conversation when you brought up Acts chapter six, and you guys were talking about the difference uh, between Hellenistic Jews and, and you know the, the Jews that, that actually uh, spoke Hebrew. And I remember in that conversation him going into that a little bit, how how Paul's writings are not um, Paul's writing are not uh, authoritative in all sense, right? They're right. not. They're not. Mm -hmm. the, Paul strays away, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to do that, right? You have at some point you have to do that if you're going to hold to the belief that no one else can be saved, right? Uh, if you're going to hold to this kind of uh, idealistic um, uh, theology that's, like you said, like Narsa Jesus, if you're going to hold to that, you got to start discounting scripture. And that's what all of the cults do. That's what the Jehovah Witness do. That's what the Mormons do. You have to start picking and choosing verses that, ident that identify, um, that you can build your theology upon, and then the verses that don't, you got to kick them out, right? Yep. Because scripture gives us a, a consistent message. Mm -hmm. And so, we're, again, we're Paul doing, he's going back to Scripture to show that this has always been the message. Right. This has always been a doctrine of Scripture. The depravity of man has always been consistent. So it was funny that you that you mentioned that when I was talking to Zakari about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. that's what I was harping on. I was mm -hmm. harping on sin, right? He kept saying exactly what you said. Oh, man, there ain't no white man. There's, there's no good white man anywhere, right? And I'm like, dude, David, the king, says I was conceived in iniquity, right? From my Psalm, mother's womb. Psalm 51. Right. We, we see all throughout scriptures, Psalm chapter 14, there's none good, right? No, none circus, uh, uh, seek after God. Uh, Isaiah 53, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Uh, Isaiah, you know, we see it all over and over again. We can, we can talk about those verses that are clearly laying down the foundation that man is sinful. And that's why mm -hmm. something like covenant theology is so important 
we understand Acts chapter 17 from one blood are all people of the earth made. Amen. We all come from the same source, and that is rebel Adam, right? Adam, who is a sinner, gave, you know, we come, we all come from him. And therefore, you get Romans chapter 5. Sin passed to all, Amen. right? Death passed to all because all sin. Romans right? 5. So 12, that's the point yeah. I was trying to drive to him. Like, hey, bro. This is not just talking about the white man. Why are you identifying just the white man with this verse, right? Yeah. Like Paul's not condemning all of mankind in this verse. He is. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's universal condemnation, Jew and Gentile alike, which is incredibly obvious if you just read Romans 1, <laughs> right. Romans 2, Romans 3. And here's what's interesting. You put this together with a concept Paul brings out in other places, like I believe 1 Corinthians. It's not about if you're in Abraham or in Jacob or not. It's Amen. if you're in Christ or if you're in Adam, if you're in the first Adam or the last or the second Adam, that's Amen. the distinction. And what that means is, are you just part, is your federal head in essence, Adam, and so Amen. you just, or you have his sin imputed to you, and then you right. sin because you are a sinner, which is Amen. which is what's going on, which means that then everyone needs the gospel because it's the only deliverance, right? Not keeping the law. Right. Uh, that's Paul says again and again, and he's not the only one though, that no one was ever saved that way and no one will be justified that way. And then you look, okay, so what's the answer? To have your federal head, and you mentioned imputation earlier, be Christ. He's the better Adam. And uh, right. just like one man came sin, one man through one man came deliverance, but it's better. Uh, and everything about the new covenant is better. So right. you see uh, all that's downplayed and, um, you know, it's it's a tragic thing. Let's try to look if we can um, uh, look at a little bit more of this. But I think that was a good discussion as far as that goes. We're not going to cover the whole video. I'm kind of skipping around, like I said. But let me go and let's uh, let's jump back over here again. I appreciate your your comment. Thing, wrong thing. I just the wrong button. Excuse me, everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Let me boom. Let me do this. And then let me do this. All right. Let's go back. Okay. So this is called, by the way, re, and it says leaving the Hebrew Israelites. And so it's a direct response the here. The Israelites are. Now, if you are an astute Bible believer, you should believe the Bible. It says that Deuteronomy 28 and 46 says that the curses will be on the Israelites locations we got mystery babylon as well oh yeah yeah yeah. that part that part yeah yeah i, I might have to play this out for a little With history bit. and archaeology hear this. so Deuteronomy 28 is very good yes it's an indicator on who the israelites are now if you are an astute bible believer you should believe the bible it says that Deuteronomy 28 and 46 says that it says the a guy it says a guy be, who uh doesn't think paul is, is the gospel right. by the way you see what I'm saying? Right. If you're in a yeah, Bible, believe, you should believe the Bible. Why, why, why is uh, the Apostle Paul, why is he considered, you know, not not uh, right for you, you know? It's funny, uh, by the way, he plays this cl these clips from uh, the Canelo <laughs> trash talk section. They right, think right, stuff right. like this is cool. They think stuff like they this. Do. It's so worldly, man. And, and again, this Absolutely. is this is Sakari, everyone. This is We're not talking about GOCC right now, okay? This is just Sakari made the response video. Uh, right. to 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 your interview, but did you have you watched this whole thing? By the way, the sound is off right now. I just got the audio. Did you watch this whole thing, Oscar? I did. I, I think I watched. I, it probably was like a couple minutes left when I when I finished it. But okay. essentially, okay. So you watched most of it. Okay. At the end, he just takes calls anyway, so it's not yeah. even really okay. okay. Yeah, it's not even really. Uh, but here, let's let me go forward a little bit more here. All right, let's see what he says here. Where the Israelites? I can go. I could really close the Bible through the Spirit of the Most High and prove that we're Israelites. <laughs> you might as well. I can right. close the Bible through the Spirit of the Most High, prove they're Israelites. And I've actually pointed that out another a number of times. Uh, the whole scheme is really extra biblical because since they have right. to have it be fulfilled on the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, they they have to go Ooh, to point. to some other source to try to show to yeah. try to prove Deuteronomy twenty eight and especially verse sixty eight and since so they, they think right. this is the captivity that means their whole place they're going to go to try to prove it is actually not even the Bible they'll try to Upside. find yeah you see what I'm saying and he, he he basically just said that I could close the Bible and prove for the Israelites now he thinks that's a good thing. Uh, yeah, it's, obviously, not it's not a good thing for you to say that. That's <laughs> not a good thing. I mean, what's your, what's your ultimate authority? First of all, we know it's yourself. Ultimately, it's yourself or your group. But, I mean, and, and so <laughs> I, th I found that fascinating. With history and archaeology. So Deuteronomy 28 is very good. Yes, it's an indicator on who the Israelites are. Now, if you are an astute Bible believer, you should believe the Bible. 
it says that Deuteronomy 28 and 46 says that the curses will be on the Israelites for a sign to show who they are. So do you care about who God's chosen people are? Well, you have some people who are really anti-Semitic, but try to say we are. You guys are really anti-Semitic because you'll say who's God's chosen people doesn't even care no more. Oscar, uh, should we care about who God's chosen people are? As far I mean, we know God's chosen people are the people of the new covenant. Amen. So, yeah, it's not an ethnic thing in the first place. Right. But, uh, and you hear all the straw manning, you know? It's like, um, how long has he been doing this? And he right. says straw man's Christian positions nonstop. Right, he even starts to identify what I'm saying with Catholicism. I'm like, uh, man, you're not yeah. listening. Yeah. You're not listening, right? You want to you wanna bring in all of, of what, what would be considered Christendom and try to put us all in one boat. When the things that I'm saying are very defined, right? They're very, very, very clear uh, of, of what I'm bringing and what I'm putting forward, which is just which is just biblical doctrine. Yeah. So in terms of who God's people are, absolutely. We, we, we understand who God's people are. We are part of God's people. And those are the people, you know, of the new covenant. Amen. It's all about the multi-ethnic church. Who cares about who he, who he said he came to die for, who he made the covenants for, who their forefathers were, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who cares? Christ is an Israelite. Who cares? When you say who cares about who the Israelites are, you're saying who cares about Jesus Christ. Dude. You see? Wow. And it's more like this. When all you say you care about is who the Israelites are, you're saying who cares about Jesus Christ. Exactly. And that's exactly. why I'll ask these guys to, to – it's sort of a litmus test to determine where they are. I'll say, all right, right. Do, you, do you believe you descend from Abraham? And sometimes they'll want to say, well, let's be specific. It's Jacob. But do you, do you descend from the patriarchs? And, yeah, you know, I can prove it, and my spirit testifies, whatever they say, right? right. And I'll say, okay, and do you believe you're in Christ? Yeah, because, you know, okay. Which one is more important, Ooh. that you're in Abraham or that you're in Christ? Now, I don't grant that they're in either, but according right. to their understanding, they are. Right, I've right, never right. met a Hebrew Israelite who answers right away in Christ. Never. Ooh, you know what? I'm using that one. I got to uh, take that one. Yeah, they, they hem and they haul, and uh, what I get usually is an answer, if they w are willing to answer, is one of two things, and they'll say this. They'll say, well, being in Abraham, because that's the only way you can be in Christ, so you have to have that as your foundation. Or they'll say it's equal. I've never wow. had anyone be like in Christ. Period. Dot. And what, what's so what's so amazing about that is it's the exact opposite. You say mm -hmm. if you're in Abraham and you're in Christ, right? When Galatians chapter three says, "If you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed." Boom! It's literally backwards. It, it literally the exact opposite. That is amazing. I got to take that one, man. I, yeah, let's let's uh, let me read that. Uh, uh, Galatians three seven is one place. And it says this, right. ladies and gentlemen, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, And you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of yeah. faith. And then uh, there's one other place uh, I might want to read here. Down at the bottom. Say what? I think it's down at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, Galatians 3, at the very end, I'll read this now, starting in verse 23. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law. By the way, this shows there our captivity, because they want to talk about captivity. The important captivity the Bible's looking at is being captive under the law, captive under sin. That's the bondage. That's the problem. Imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now the faith has come. We are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you all one in Christ Jesus. And here's the kicker. And it if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Right? Couldn't be more clear. Couldn't be more clear. Praise God, man. Uh, those are powerful, powerful verses. And notice it's, it's a section. It's a chunk. You could read all through yeah. it in a minute. You don't have to skip around and then say, well, Paul went off here, you know. It's just stupid. It don't make any sense. You guys are the real anti-Semitics. 
that we know in Scripture, Israelites break the It's anti-Semites, first of all. And it's bizarre <laughs> that somebody who uh, refers to uh, people, you know, as cracker, Amalekites, and all this, <laughs> is claiming we're anti-Semites. It's super bizarre. Uh, uh, dear Lord. Anyways, let's continue on here, see what he says. Right, which is kind of weird because they're acting as if they're still that same covenant. But mm -hmm. they break this covenant. And the curses for breaking the covenant are listed in Deuteronomy 28. So what they would say is you look at the curses and look at who the curses apply to in the world. And that's how you find out who the Israelites are. Okay, well, let's see if he agrees with the Bible or not. He's saying that they're, they're saying that you look at the curses and that's who you identify who the Hebrews are. Are we saying that or does the Bible say that? Deuteronomy 28 and 46. What does the text read? It says, and they, talking about the curses, shall be upon thee for a sign. This word, where did, what the heck just happened here? All right, it says. All right, so he goes to Deuteronomy 28, 46, and he tries to use that, which says this, everybody, they shall be a sign and a wonder against you and your offspring forever. And uh, the verse before it, verse 45, says this, All these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you till you are destroyed, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and the statutes he commanded you. So he's trying to utilize that to try to say, uh, this is how we know who the Israelites are, because there will be the people who are cursed. Right? Right. Now, check this out. A few things. Number one, uh, it says they shall be a sign and a wonder, right? And uh, mm -hmm. it says uh, forever. Sign of wonder against you forever. That's interesting yeah. because uh, the, if if they were always a sign and a wonder to identify them as the Israelites, then how could they ever forget who they are? If it's going to be a sign for – if that's what it means. It doesn't mean that, by the way, everybody. But if it meant that the curses will be attached to those people who are known to be Israelites, right, and that's how you know who they are, then if it's always with them, how would they ever not know who they are? Yeah. And number number two – uh, if you start according to them, I would say when you come to Christ, that's a biblical answer. But when you start obeying the law, statutes, and commandments, then the curses won't be upon you anymore. Then how would you still be able to identify that you're an Israelite now? Right. right. There's, a, there's a lot of problems. Here's what the verse really means, though, everybody. It's yeah. saying that the evidence and proof of my word that I'm going to keep is that you will have these judgments against you as long as you disobey me. So if you disobey, the evidence of me keeping my word, which is to punish your sin, will be that people will see the judgment that's happened and befallen upon Israel. Uh, right. It's not It's not because you're going to lose your ethnic identity and forget who you are. That, that idea is not in there. It doesn't say anything about you'll forget who you are. You won't know who you are. I mean, don't, don't you think it's interesting? The curse of you're going to forget your ethnic identity is nowhere in the Bible. That that thing, where's that ever at? You know, right? I mean, they have to. They, you have to implore that. You have to implore that because you got a what a two thousand year, eighteen hundred year uh, time span in which there's an, a great apostasy, and that the true biblical gospel is lost. And so you have to say that there's a falling away uh, in order in order to make your 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 doctrine work. Let's look a little more of this. And they, Ten more minutes. the curses Let's shall be upon a little bit. I would really uh, point to, okay. but not to say that. Let's see here. Hold on one second. When you read the Hebrew Genesis one, it says the firmament is a half dome. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is How the hell? So, um, question, Oscar, do yeah. you know if GOCC embraces the flat Earth doctrine? They do not. They do not. No. Okay. So I didn't um, know that they said that. I didn't know that. Well, I don't know if all of Sakari does or if it's just Haka, but in the context of responding to you, right? Hmm. He capes for the flat earth. Yeah. <laughs> because um the cultish hosts were kind of using an analogy, like saying right. about the conspiracy theory and stuff, which yeah, is a big yeah, part yeah. of GOCC. The conspiracy Huge. theory elements. Huge. Right. Maybe even more so than any other camp. That's how a lot of people get oh, into Rakha's teachings. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. So they mentioned, well, this is kind of like almost like a flat earth of, of religion, you know, the conspiracy theory and stuff like that. 
And in that, he's he becomes flustered because they 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 said a slur, if you will, against a flat Earth doctrine. And then he promotes flat Earthism in the con- yeah. it's just it's just uh, it's just one more way that, that they're off. Now it's not a salvation issue, but did you you caught mm-hmm. that when he brought that out? I did. Yeah, I did, and it was I it was I wasn't expecting it. You know, I wasn't expecting yeah. it. that. Was just like a statement uh, uh, that the host made. He just made it really quick, and I didn't think he would uh, harp on that. But he he kind of zeroed in on that for a little bit there, and that kind of surprised me. Uh, let's see if we can get to the actual clip. I think we're pretty close to where he let's says it. Let's keep going. From Israelite, see, see this, see this is what I find really interesting too. And I think about like uh, flat earthers, mm-hmm. um, like I, I feel. I, listening to some of the so, it, it, flat earthers you guys don't even know when you read the hebrew genesis 1 it says the firmament is a half dome how the hell can a half dome be over a globe huh so why is it so funny to 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 to, to bring up the whole flat earth like that's just so funny like the ancient civilizations even from a hebraic perspective they believed in the flat earth so why the hell is that funny? <laughs> Don't make fun of my flat earth. That seemed to bother him a bit right there. Hey, don't be talking about the flat earth that way. It is that was a really easy. Yeah. The, 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 the Hebrew does not say half dome. Half now, there, dome. Yeah, it does not say. Now, there are interpretations that people can give, and I understand where he's like trying to go with that. Right. But it, the Hebrew doesn't say uh, what, what he says. It talks about something stretched right. out, and there's un- right. there's understandings, and people do look at the A and E. So I know what he's trying to talk about. Heiser, yeah. for example, someone just mentioned Heiser. He he mentioned some of this kind of stuff, and you can take it different way. But yeah, he took that really personal, man. Don't be don't be he talking did. about Hakas flat Earth, bro. Right. That seemed like it bothered him almost more than anything else. Yeah. Let's let's go on a little bit more here. The the things that I hear, you know, from the Black Hebrew Israelites, it's almost like the flat Earth of uh, a, a Christian. If you don't shut your ass up, man. First of all, we're, that's our brother. We want him to repent. But you, you, you two, you guys got nothing but extermination coming. That's all you got. You need to put the whole book down. And you can email me at sakariseattle at gmail dot com, and I'll, I'll sign a document and notarize it. That if we had a live dialogue, I wouldn't say one curse word, insult, or ad hominem. We just want to get people like you guys who think you know our book and just destroy you. Theologically. Hey, uh, t- uh, mods block um, uh, Israel for real. I let him run around and say whatever, but what he just said, that I'm not going to put up with that. So we're going to have to get rid of you. Uh, I, we, we let you disagree and say all kinds of stuff. But when you start saying that kind of stuff about about my guest and my people, uh, you're you're gone. So Mods, uh, Israel for real, I will see you later, which means probably never. All right, so check this out. Um, it's funny. He starts out with a curse, with an insult, right? <laughs> and then he says, well, I'll sign a document. We'll debate where I won't insult and I won't curse. Right, like, let me right, tell you right. something. Uh, you ever seen an old cowboy movie and uh, you, you got the white cowboy and he shakes the, the Native American's hand, you know, that they called the red yeah. men back then. Uh, yeah. we, we're not going to do this peace treaty. We won't take your land. Uh, Haka signing a document saying that he's not going to curse or insult you is worth about as much as a white cowboy's handshake to an Indian. Right. That's that's right. how much that's worth. It means it's not worth anything. I don't care right. what he signs or what he says. Now, because I think I know Haka a little bit better than you from what I've been able to tell. Uh, yeah. His word is literally worthless and meaningless. In fact, they've even indicated that you can lie to non-Israelites as they perceive it. Almost Ooh. like almost like a Sakari Takia. Takia is where the Shia Muslims believe that yeah. for the for the furtherance of Islam, you can essentially tell falsehoods, and that's a certain Quranic interpretation they go with. And I believe Sakari basically teaches the same thing. I, 100% when I was talking to them, uh, one of the times I, I'd had a few different interactions with them. And one of the mm-hmm. times when we were going over uh, the Decalogue, I mentioned bears false wit. I mentioned lying mm-hmm. in, in relation to bearing false witness. And? and they said, no, lying is not bearing false witness, right? That doesn't, that you don't, we don't identify lying with bearing false witness. That means something, they were like, something happened. And uh, it was whether or not you were there when it happened. But that doesn't identify with lying. And I was like, are you serious? Lying is not a sin. No, lying, at night, lying in the way that we understand it is not. But Oscar, you don't keep the law. Right. 
I don't keep the law. When you're literally redefining what the law means, but I don't keep it. You don't keep the law because you don't wear your fringes anymore. Oh, my goodness, dude. That that was surprising. Like, I, I wasn't expecting that. I mean, that man told me he hadn't sinned. The guy I was talking to, he told me he hadn't sinned in three years. He that was a lie, right? And that was a lie right there. And, and I said, you're lying right now. Well, well, lying doesn't actually mean bearing false. I was like, dude, all right, man. I'm just, I can't go any further with that one. If, right. if you're not going to, you're not, see, it's, when you're having a conversation with somebody who's affirming scripture, they say that they believe in scripture and you have a conversation and you start dealing with a topic like that. I just assume that you're going to identify it to some extent. But once you throw it out the window and say, I don't even, I don't even believe that this is lying. I'm like, okay, there's no, we can't go any further with that topic because right. I believe you don't. A shout out to Orthodox Moore and BK Apologist in the live chat. Uh, and shout out to Judah the Lion. He's our GOCC fan man. Uh, every time we do anything with GOCC, he comes on to make sure to, to cape for GOCC. But uh, we like him, and, and we try to be nice to him, and he tries to be nice to us until he leaves us. Then he goes and talks bad about us to his fellow GOCC folks. But we love him nonetheless. We know how he is. And uh, shout out to that man. Now, check it out. Uh, did you hear he said, but you two, because he's so he thinks he can assume their ethnic identity by looking at them, you know, right. you two, as if you can do you can do such a thing, uh, have nothing but extermination coming to you. Now, ex extermination, right? So that's kind of sort of something you would use for termites, right? You know what I'm saying? In, 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 right. Insect, a pest, which is which is how he would say, yeah, exactly right. Right. But here's what's interesting. Uh, according to their doctrine, it's not even really extermination. It's temporary termination until reincarnation. Right. It's temporary uh, termination until the fourth generation reincarnation, because they believe after three or four generations, you reincarnate. You essentially respawn three or four generations later. Like you guys know when you play uh, Call of Duty or something and you get blasted, you know, and then you respawn in that location. They believe that happens every time you die, except it takes three or four generations for it to happen. That's what Sakari, that's what Sakari teaches. I got and, and I got that from them when I was speaking to them. So is that endless? Like, it, does that yes. never stop? Yes. And sometimes I, I mess around with them a little bit uh, because uh, there's a verse they use uh, that says there will be no end to the people. And uh, mm. I believe it's from the Apoch, if I'm not mistaken. And I'll say, well, uh, I'll say, well, wait a minute. Aren't the Edomites going to be wiped out forever? Right. Or something like that. Like, you know, uh, but but there's a there's a there's a confusion there. Uh, but yeah, they they do believe in reincarnation, and uh, they think it takes three or four generations for you to respawn, and you can't jump ethnicities. And a I lot of that. one westerners teach you can't even jump tribes. Although there's some problems with that, because uh, there's there's some evidence. Like for example, they Tahar, who leads GMS that Sakari came out of, uh, yeah. he's supposed to be. Oh, uh, what is is he supposed to be Levi? No, I forgot what he's supposed. To be. I think he's supposed to be. Uh, Levi, if I'm not mistaken, but the problem is that uh, Tahar, um, they say that he's the Apostle Paul reincarnated. A lot of them have talked that, right? But that doesn't make sense because Paul was Benjamin. So how could he try? So how could he? So how could he tribal? How could he jump tribes? So there's right. a debate tribal amongst jump. them about that. Yeah, and, you're breaking uh, your own, and that's crazy. But what else did you get from Sakari? So you're hearing some similar things, like about not sinning yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I uh, so in that conversation, like I said, it was it was there even like uh, let me say their understanding of they they kind of and all of the Hebrews do this they 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 uh, they confine sin to the transgression of the law and we know that sin is transgression of the law right it even it says that in the New Testament but uh, what I point them to is uh, Romans chapter fourteen where it says not only is it simply transgression of the law as far as what you're physically doing. Right. Mm -hmm. But it says all things done without faith are sin. Right. So in, in yeah. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five, we see Christ going into that. Right. It's not simply what you're doing with your body. Right. right. But you have heard it said you have heard it said over and over and over again. There's also the things that are happening in your mind. So uh, regarding language, something that you brought up, you know, language, you're speaking out of the abundance of your heart. What's in your heart? Right. What, what, what I think it's Mark chapter seven. What's in your heart, right? Man, all of this manner of sin comes out. It's overflowing from his heart. Right. So when you see a man's language, right? And again, the ones that were out there, they started off the conversation pretty, you know, insulted me and things like that. But once they see I had a handle on what they believe, it kind of calmed down a little bit. Uh -huh. um, but again, I'm like, dude, you guys got to listen to what you're saying. Because if you're listening, you know where your words are coming from. They're coming from your heart. 
right? And th it's a heart of sin. If you haven't repented and, and received Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's coming from a heart of sin. And your words express that. We see what's in your heart from your words. Amen. Um, check it out. We're hitting about our time we wanted to end. I'm looking through this video. There's other stuff in here I'd like to cover. Um, but here's what I'm going to say, because I want to I stick to about the, the time we said and stuff like that. First of all, I've, I've, uh, let's transition back. I'm going to put it in both screen. Um, let me get my thoughts together here. First of all, shout out to Nate for the super chat. And he says, shout out to the Moabites. <laughs> Nate uh, would be identified as a Moabite according to their 18 nations or whatever. And uh, let me bring it back to where everyone can see both of us. So that goes right here. All right. And now let me say this. I've enjoyed speaking with you, Oscar, both when we talked a few times on the phone and through texting and whatnot. And then also um, uh, today, not just your testimony and some of that, but kind of looking at this video together, which was a response to you. We just looked at some sections, but I enjoyed that as well. So thank you very much for all of that. And uh, just the clarity to which you brought the gospel and, and, and everything. So just I hope you feel encouraged and blessed. And I know you've blessed and encouraged others. Now with that, maybe another time we can go through the rest of this video or something. I'll have to look at it because there's a specific section in there where he gets into the book of Revelation. And mm. when you're when you're going to bat for the deity of Christ, which the stuff you said was all good stuff, he tries to combat it, and he tries to do this Jehovah's Witness watchtower argument to show that right. Jesus is not the Most High, and he doesn't receive the same kind of worship as as only the Most High God does. I want to get into that. I I've actually uh, have an article on it that I've written and a number of other things, uh, but we need to stay about an hour and a half here. But I want to make sure— I'm going to stop now. You kind of get a final word uh, about that video and anything you want to say us about that. And then a final word before we close out here, uh, Brother Oscar. Okay. Yeah. What I'll say is, uh, again, thanks for the opportunity, man. Any Anything that I could do as far as my testimony and where I come from in order to shed light uh, on the true gospel and uh, as well as shedding light on, on these false gospels. And one in particular that I was a part of, this Hebrewism. Uh, I jump at the opportunity. It's a, it's a blessing from God, and it's uh, it's an opportunity that I think can help a lot of people as far as people who are coming out of it, people who are coming against it, right? Um, both of those can, can benefit greatly from it, and just encouragement to the saints. God is at work. God is building his church from every aspect of, of, of the world, right? From every different ethnic, ethnicity and different walks of life, he's building his church. He's gathering his elect. Uh, and regarding, to, regarding the video, um, it was sent to me a couple of days ago. Uh, I was able to get through, like I said, high, uh, the majority of it, and it's mm -hmm. a lot of what's to be expected. Um, again, it's, it's some language in there for those who are going to go and watch it. Mm -hmm. But uh, for those who are interested, go watch the video and look at look at the way that they break down scripture and how inconsistent it is. Mm -hmm. Right? How they, like you brought up, how they're breaking their own rules uh, with their theology. And understand that this, along with most of these other cults, right? I would say all of them, they have to depart from scripture at a certain point mm -hmm. because it's no longer Going to affirm what they're teaching, so I say us as Christians, we got to go out there and expose this stuff. We gotta, we gotta cast these down, um, because you can't be saved with a false gospel. You can't Amen. be saved with. The Amen. We know that Christ is God in the flesh. We know that He receives the honor and worship. I think Revelation chapter five is one thing that we can point to. Uh, Christ is God in the flesh. We mm -hmm. believe Him as our Savior. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. And that, uh, that Revelation 5, uh, that's some of the place uh, where if we did a follow-up discussion or if I maybe we were able to hit, hit up this video again, that'd be a, a place to look at. Shout out to, again, the sister who came out of GOCC. She was in there for 13 years. Like I said, I'd like to hear uh, from you. And shout out to Dre Day for Christ. Uh, he does a lot of great stuff on his YouTube and, and uh, Instagram page, uh, finding clips and stuff like that. He... he, he um, he, uh, in fact, he recently helped me. I was like, "Hey, do you have a clip of this?" Or really? so he's got a lot of, a lot of good stuff. It, it's tough because you know if you do videos where you expose um, some of the hate, hateful content, like with some of the groups. Again, I am more talking about groups like Sakar than I am GOCC. Well, not that we agree with GOCC, but you don't find the same level of vitriol from them. In fact, uh, I've met some GOCC people that uh, I really like. On average, I, I really like them on a personal level. They think I have a personal thing against them i don't it's the doctrine but most gocc people i've met uh i i don't have anything i don't have negative thoughts about them as people There's some really right. great people you know that i've much met more, say much what more mild. yeah said, but, they're much more 
Yeah, they're more like real people. You can have a real conversation. <laughs> they, right. they there's more. You see the compassion of Christ in GOCC members on average a lot more. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot more sincerity, and, all, and this is mainly comparing them to Sakari since that's a reaction video. And so yeah. I, I um, I, this it's not a hate thing, guys. Just to disagree, and I hope you see that Oscar Oscar doesn't hate the people that are in GOCC. He loves them. Why would he mm-hmm. be in it and then turn around and just hate them? He just doesn't think the ideas are right, and he cares. He wants you to come out of. It. I mean, that's what he said here today, and and I feel the same way. So, um, I hope people understand that, but. So shout out to to the folks at GOCC and a positive tip in the sense of I uh, hope we can still build. But, you know, the tough thing is when you do like what Dre Day does, where he takes clips of Sakari uh, spewing vitriol and venom, you get banged for hate speech and anti-Semitic stuff on, on a social media because you're sharing it to expose it. But then they bang you because to them, they, they, you know, I don't know how their filters work, but they, they're like, hey, this is, violates community guidelines. It happens all the time with people who share clips of them to sh- expose it. They get banged themselves because we're, we're like, yeah, the content yeah. is hateful. That's why we're trying to, you know, it's, it's really oh, tough. Yeah, okay. it, it happens all the time when we share it to expose it. We get banged and stuff across. Yeah. And that, that, that happens to us all the time. And especially guys like Dre Day. Um, hey, shout out to Miss Kitty. Thank you for uh, thank you for your super chat. Let's try to talk again, and I pray uh, the Lord blesses your work today. I know you're going to be doing some stuff later on today, and uh, let's uh, let's talk again. But thank you so much, Oscar. And I hope we could have some positive, not just negative feedback after this. This is over, <laughs> but you seem to be able to take the hits. So, yeah, man. it's all good, man. Again, thanks for the for the opportunity, man, and bless you and your ministry. It's been it's been huge. Uh, a huge had a huge impact on me and uh just thank you for it man i appreciate that brother let's talk again i'm gonna hit that button that makes the show end and uh it goes a little bit like this